Number one, okay, welcome back to Coffee with Coaches. Um, it's been a minute. Uh, we have Corbin Weeks here from Montreat College um, in North Carolina. Um, mm. So I'll let you, I, I won't take away uh, your introduction. I'll let you tell us who you are and maybe a little bit about your background, coaching background, that sort of thing. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm from uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Originally played baseball at Southeastern University down in Florida, NAI. Um, moved to Montreat in 2019 uh, on the baseball staff and never envisioned that I would be coaching softball. Um, and so I started as the lowest man on the totem pole as a graduate assistant and did the grunt work for a long time. Um and then uh, got into coaching softball last year. So I'm starting year two. Um, and so I'm really excited. So is that enough? Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the best sport ever. Yeah. Yes, I've loved it. I, at <laughs> first, like, I wasn't sure, to be honest, to leave everything that I ever knew. And um, I really wasn't sure until halfway through the fall when um, a couple things started going right. And I was like, okay, I can get behind this. <laughs> so um, it's been a lot of fun, but I've got uh, great support from our president, our administration, um, great coaching staff. And um, again, your program is only as good as his people. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have great people around me. Tell me a little bit uh, about Montreat. I do. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the NAIA realm itself, but Talk a little bit about Montreat, like, you know, size, uh, your roster, scholarships, like stuff like that kind of yeah, plug so, for yourself. Um, yeah. So I had never even heard of Montreat. Um, it's been around Same. like 120 years. Yeah. It's, it's really old. It's actually the home of Billy Graham. Um, he taught here and, oh um, his family was super ingrained and, um, our baseball coach was my coach at Southeastern. And so he called me in 2016 and said, I'm going to Montreat. And I said, where? Yeah. And he said, uh, Montreat in, in Asheville, North Carolina. And I was like, where? <laughs> and so um, I actually came and visited him um, that summer. Never envisioned that two years later, like my wife and I would be here. Um, and so um, we're in a little town called Black Mountain, about 10 minutes outside of Asheville. And I don't know if you guys have heard of Asheville. UNC um, Asheville. That's all I know. They didn't. Yeah. Have like yeah. Really so Asheville is like basketball the player. hottest. Yeah. Yeah. So Asheville is like the hottest destination to visit on the East Coast right now. Um, in the mountains, like big brewery yeah. town, arts, music scene. Is it like, on the other side of the Smokies? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we're two hours from Knoxville, two hours from Charlotte. So like right in the middle. Gotcha. Um, really, really cool area. Super mild weather. We get four seasons. Uh, the leaves change, no snow, um, really, really cool. And I think that's such a huge draw for like um, our kids, especially coming from different parts of the country, because everybody that comes here says it feels like home in some capacity. Um, and so it's it's a super cool place, um, a ton of history. Um, and again, like the town of Asheville is such a big draw for us. Um, you know, a lot of schools, especially small NAI schools, like they're in the middle of nowhere, mm. like two hours to an airport, like your town has a gas station. And so we kind of get the best of both worlds because Black Mountain um, is a small mom and pop town of like 6,000 with breweries and restaurants and all that. And then you go right down the street and you've got a big downtown area um, with shopping and dining and movie theaters and all the good stuff. So um, it's pretty cool. I'm jealous. <laughs> I was actually, I was in Gatlinburg last week. Yeah. Yeah. Like and, two hours. Uh... Yeah, nothing. I, uh, you know, anyone listening or, you know, Corbin yourself, no uh, shame to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge, but nothing could have prepared me for the Wisconsin Dells of the South. Um, <laughs> I, you know, we're, we're big hiking people. And so we've never been to the Smokies, which were beautiful. We did an 11 mile hike. Uh, I thought I was going to die. Oh. But um, yeah, the, the, the Pigeon Forge situation, I was like, I left my Mountain Dew at home. Like I, yeah, nothing could have prepared me for that. So, yeah, but and that's with, all commercialized too. Like, oh, what? 100%. We're, we're, we're the opposite. We're still. Exactly. So someone told me, they were like, if you go to the other side, the North Carolina side, which made me think of like, oh yeah, UNC Asheville, all that stuff is like, it's a yeah. little more elevated, more golf courses, more spa, you know, you know brewery stuff like that so yeah. i i actually just wrote down black mountain for uh 
personal reference for yeah. myself. <laughs> and Black Mountain has been voted like the best small town in America to visit a couple times. And so Noted. Um, unfortunately, every time it gets published, like our town gets flooded. But sure. uh, yeah, it's it's a great place. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's like stepping into a Hallmark movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I wish I honestly um, I, mean, I know we'll go into this, but like I wish that, you know, like somebody had would have told me that like those places exist because mm. I I mean I went to a school as division two like the school pretty much made up the population of the town um people didn't know what to do and you know campus wasn't in session and um I think that there's some like real serious preconceived notions about um those small schools and that maybe you didn't want to go to a small school but you know you go there and you're like oh yeah this actually feels like a place I could be so what um tell me about tell me what what you've done for for Montreat like uh obviously you took the program over la- last year you made significant changes like significant changes records wise um coaching staff wise and then tell me kind of like what your approach was and your philosophy of that sort of thing yeah um so for me um when i took this job like i really didn't know what i was getting into um and so i've always felt like one of my gifts has been recruiting um just the ability to connect with players and and get on their level and um when i took softball like i mean as far as like strategy and x's and o's i was like blind to it but um i knew if i could recruit well like we could be competitive and so um I really just started utilizing some of my baseball contacts to make softball contacts um, around the country, um, specifically the Northwest, um, the Southwest. And um, I think I brought in 14 transfers last year. Nice. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. um, And that was just June and July, 14 transfers. Um, or it might've been 13 and a freshman. And was that like a mix? Was that a four-year mix? Was that Juco? Was that... Yeah, that was um, mostly JUCO players, um, Mm -hmm. a couple of four-year transfers. Um, But for me, like, um, I love the transfers. Like, I I think there's a ton of value that they bring. Um, Not to say that the high school athlete doesn't give anything to a program, but um, for me, I was in a position where, like, I wanted to win now. And Mm -hmm. I had to do what it took to to really turn around a program that hadn't seen, um, you know, very much success in a long time. Um, a little over a decade. And so um, I knew like, if I could get talent, like I could develop talent too. Sure. Um, and so we went out and and at that time um, I was by myself. I didn't have an assistant and I just started banging the phones and, you know, 14 transfers showed up or 13 and a freshman. So. And I think it, it says something a lot too, like the playing maturity from transfers versus an 18 year old coming in from high school or a travel ball program is to to me night and day like you know I think coach and I can both like we were both transfers from many different walks of playing and um there is an intimidation factor because there's some coaches that like freshmen that come in where they can mold and be like, you're going to be a player that I want you to be. Mm -hmm. And it says a lot about a coach that can say like, I want experience and I'm also going to take like what you bring to the table, but I'm also going to add to it. And it's almost like a blended family in a sense. So I really appreciate you like saying that because, you know, it can be intimidating, especially now, which, you know, I can't imagine being a college coach right now and in the transfer portal, which that can be a whole nother conversation, but, um, good on you for being like, I want to win now, because at the end of the day, you inherited a program that obviously didn't see much success. And you're just like, let's see, like, I want to show you what success looks like. And that's very much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Contagious. Yeah. Yeah. And winning is contagious. Like, yes. Um, for me, like, um, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. Like, um, I, I think that it's so important, whether it's in your household, like your children, like your spouse, like the Bible talks about being equally yoked. Right. And you could use that in many different senses. But for me, like in my program, like I want winners, like Mm -hmm. I want girls that I say like, all right, we're going to run through a wall. And they say, which wall, like, Mm -hmm. that's a big deal for me. Like, 
um, you know, if you marry somebody that has a different belief system than you, it's probably not going to work. And that's the same, like in roster construction too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I can totally go down that rabbit hole about like the recruiting process and like our kind of the rigors that we put into it. But for me, it's like at the end of the day, um, I think there's a lot of different components to like building a real roster and what that looks like for me last year, it was transfers and I'll take whatever high school kids I can get because it was so late. And to be honest with you, I didn't understand how early softball recruiting trended compared to baseball. Yeah. Like in baseball, we were signing guys like after class started and they were like jumping on planes, but like mm -hmm. it's, it's different in a fact, in the fact that like a lot of females, they know what they want. They know what they're looking for. And when they find that, like they're committing so much earlier. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, when I took the job in the middle of May last year, like 24s were done. Like mm -hmm. it was, you know, very, very few and far between was I finding a kid. I only signed one high school kid last summer from Spokane, Washington. Wow. Um, did a pretty big role as a freshman, but everybody else, you know, was transfers for the most part. Um, and so like fast forward to where I am right now, I'm going to be graduating between this year and next year. I'm going to be graduating 20. And so I'm in a position right now where I'm saying, okay, now I need to invest in the high school athlete, Sure. right? Invest in them. And so for me last year, it was bring in the transfers, get the experience, sprinkle in the freshmen. Now I'm in the opposite where I'm saying, okay, I'm spending all of my money on high school kids that I know I can develop. And then I'm going to go out and get a few Juco transfers or portal kids to kind of plug the holes. Can you talk about what you mean by like develop, right? Like, cause I think everyone uses that, that term interchangeably, right? Cause when you look at like the recruiting space, right? Like I look at, and, and this is just my philosophy. I look at, can I find an athlete that I can make a, a qualified intellectual softball player, right? Um, oftentimes I feel like some of those kids who are like high IQ, um, real skilled at an early age, they plateau. Like, and I think that that's great. Like, I mean, obviously we're talking difference between NCAA and NAIA, but like, I think it's great that there's some like lines that have been drawn there because like those kids that were committing, you know, like eighth grade year, like what if like, that's it, you know what I mean? And you're like, shit, like, what if that's it? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about what you mean by like develop, like, what do you look for in an athlete that you're like, I can develop that kid? Yeah. And so, um, I actually feel like pretty strongly about this subject. Um, I think a lot of coaches throw around this term, like player development, or sure. I can develop you, but nobody asks how mm -hmm. the player never asks how. The parent never asks how. And so it's become one of those buzz terms like culture, right? These these buzzwords that coaches throw around to make kids feel good. And so um, for me, like when I'm recruiting a kid, I'm telling them, like I'm actively saying, here's where you are. Here's where I think you can be. Here's the roadmap of how we're going to do it. And I just met with a kid today um, from Athens, Georgia, 25, that we're hoping to land. Um, and I had this same conversation. She's been on a ton of visits. Everybody's been kind of tossing around the same verbiage. It's just kind of the way the game's trended. But no one's told her, like, here's how we're going to do it. And so um, for me, like part of my recruiting strategy and um, – I guess I can I can say maybe it's because of baseball. I spent my whole life in baseball. Baseball's 10 years ahead of softball. Mm -hmm. Because just in terms of like resources, things that they've had for a long time. Sure. I think softball coaches do themselves a disservice because they're always looking for the best player at a specific position. Oh, yes. You totally. Hear say, you hear a coach say, well, I'm looking for a shortstop or I'm looking for a catcher, right? Or I'm looking for a center fielder. Mm-hmm. People ask me all the time, like, coach, what are you looking for? And I literally say every time I'm looking for the best available athlete that can hit at a high level. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a God given ability to hitting like, you know, either you can or you can't. Like, I think sure. we can fine tune some things, but like either you can or you can't. Sure. But from a player development piece, like I can I trust my staff and myself that if we bring in a shortstop who is super athletic, I know that I can turn her into a center fielder. 
Or for example, I just brought in a transfer from a D2 school um, and she was a middle infielder, outfielder. She's catching this year. Mm -hmm. She's just athletic. She can do it. And so for me, I know that I can take a player and mold them into what I want them to be simply because of our fall roadmap that we have. So, um, and there's some secret stuff in that roadmap, but yeah, like, say, don't again, tell all your secrets. Yeah. yeah so no, like, that's, that's a, that's a beautifully explained way because, you know, especially with, uh, divisions that don't have a staff of like four or five, especially when you have, uh, staffs that have strictly player development coaches, yeah. um, you know, and I, as a travel ball coach, like I'm looking for the best athletes. Yeah. Like I want a kid that can just ball like, yeah. and, and, and at the end of the day, usually those higher division one schools, that's what they're looking for too. Um, there's been many stories. Like I know I played against a girl and she was the best shortstop. She was a hurdler. She was the point guard. She caught at Wisconsin yeah. and never caught, you know? So it's, it's, you definitely see that in two. And, and, and I would say just from the, um, travel ball perspective usually those higher level travel ball like when we would play really really good teams they would just put their infield on a carousel and mm. every inning it would just be boop 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 yeah. boop boop and it'd be everyone totally different at a position so um kudos for you for saying that because that was very well explained yeah I love that but what I will say is like I've been a part of coaching staff um and I've seen coaching staff who um and I just spoke to um, a woman who works for high level throwing. And she was like, you know, what's crazy is, is like the development portion of the game has gone away, right? Like the expectation that kids are supposed to be at this level already. And then they're like, okay, I just want a kid that I can be like, Hey, throw ball, catch ball, be able to charge on a bun, be able to slot throw, be able to go and you know, be loaded into your back leg. Hey, be able to hit this pitch, whatever. And you're just like, like what, so are you managing a team or coaching a team? Right. Sure. Like that reminds me a lot of like, and I'm not knocking on the MLB, but like, come on, like it, it, it's pretty much like MLB, like type of, of coaching and yeah, I'm knocking those people that do that, like fantastic. They can bring in athletes that they don't really have to coach. But what I'll give props to is like the U of U, uh, um, their hitting coach who previously coached at ISU, uh, when I went to the clinic, she was like, this athlete needs a little bit more of this. This athlete hits like judge. This athlete hits like mm -hmm. individual. And yeah. each and and the drills were down to like the athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Which I love because that shows that it's not like, hey, you will hit this way. She, One size fits all. Yeah, I'll meet you where you're at and 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 I'm gonna capitalize on what you've already established. Um, so yeah, I love that. I love to hear, like Andy said, I love to hear that there are coaches out there that one, meet kids where they're at, but two, like, I think to me as like an athlete I, and what I do, I, if that coach told me, Hey, I can, you're here and I can, you can be here and this is how we'll get you here. Oftentimes people are just like, I want you to be here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. So, um, for like, obviously before we get into like the NAIA bit, what, like, why, um, like, what do you believe that, you know, like Montre and your staff and like the kids that love to be a part of your program, like what, what is it that makes you separated from maybe other NAIA schools or schools that are competitive, uh, conference or non-conference? Yeah. So, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, for me, I, I'd like to say that what it boils down to is stability. Yeah. Uh, I think that not only our college, but our coaching staff provides a player stability. Um, and so including myself, we have six on staff. And so um, I do the offensive stuff and catchers. My assistant, uh, Alyssa, she does infielders. My pitching coach obviously does pitching. I have a pitching GA. Nice. I have a strength and conditioning GA. Um, and then I have an outfielders GA and they all assist in recruiting and things like that. But, um, like what it boils down to is honestly stability, um, both in the institution and in the program. Now, um, uh, montreat has been around 120 years with a phenomenal staff, phenomenal pres uh, president. And so the one thing that I can sit down with and, and tell families is like, look, 
there's a very good chance like this school is going to be around much longer than we are. We are not mm. one of the small schools where they're cutting budgets and sure. uh, doors are closing and, and they're, we're having to to rub pennies together. Like Montreat is in a very good position um, to continue to expand and take care of its athletes. Um, and so for us, like I said, location, that's obviously like a huge, um, a huge positive for us. Um, we stack academic and athletic money. If you do get into our honors program, um, and obviously, like, to be honest, like I tell kids, it doesn't matter where the money comes from as long as it's there. Yeah, right. Yep. Um, and so obviously, the smarter you are and the more money we can stack, the better your financial package is going to be. Um, small class sizes, your gen eds might be 30 kids in a class. And so that personal relationship that you have um, with your professors, especially being on the road, and you guys know how that goes. Um we're about a thousand students on campus and about 700 are athletes. And so like our school is, um, is a living, breathing culture of athletics, mm -hmm. uh, soccer games. Everybody's there. You go to volleyball games, everybody's there. Baseball games, everybody's there, even softball too. Like, um, and I truly believe like that's what drives our campus is, um, you know, most people are relatable. And so for us, like, when I'm recruiting a kid, like I always say that a kid needs two anchors to stay at a school. Okay. Um, and I heard one of our VPs explain this like five years ago. And um, one of those anchors is going to be softball, right? They're coming to school to play softball. But like, what is that second anchor that's going to keep them here? Right. So when the days are not going great at softball, or maybe, um, you know, they they're late for practice and, and they're maybe they miss weights or maybe like the softball day isn't going so well. What's the second anchor that's going to keep them here? Is it the degree? Is it a is it a, a, a class? Is it a professor? Is it our campus pastor? Like, what is that second anchor that's going to keep them here? And 99 percent of the time, if a kid doesn't have two anchors, they're going to leave whatever school that they're at. Like I tell kids all the time, if you pick a school because of your sport, you're going to leave because it's going to get hard and you're going to have nothing to fall back on, right? I even have kids, girls that are at Montreat that were previously on the team and they said, coach, I just don't love the game anymore, but I mm -hmm. love, I want to stay. They're still on scholarship and I'm okay with that because again, like we value person over player. And so again, like we want to win games and we want to win a national championship. We want to do all the things. But at the end of the day, like we want them to get an education and be able to survive like that. That's the goal. Um, and so like that culture right there is just imminent across our campus. Yeah, I love that because I think I mean, I personally can relate to that. Like, you know, I when I transferred to my four year, like was the program great? No. But I loved my teammates. The coach like my was great. Come on. <laughs> Dude, you were there for six months. <laughs> um, but you know, it it but like my professor was great. Like he was in my wedding. Like, you know, all those things stacked up. Like I went back to my master's. And that's something too that like it's so frustrating. And coach, like I know you can agree with this too, is like as a recruiter or as like a travel ball coach, you can't say that enough to kids because the amount of phone calls that I got this past fall about my girls wanting to transfer because they chose the school over for softball only and they realized how miserable their life were, like, it's it makes me sad because it's like, did I fail them? Right. But, you know, they're still happy. Like, they still found, like, a new, you know, like, they're on a different journey, which is totally fine because, like, it's softball is not end-all, be-all. And we preach this all the time is that, like, what's your 40, 40s year plan and good for you for like allowing their girls, those girls to like still be on scholarship and stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, like they want to look back and be like, my college experience was great. And even though they don't play for you, like I'm sure that they can still call you. Yeah, of course. That's it's, awesome. It, um, I, you know, like I say this all the time and what I do, uh, you know, and I love that you say two anchors because it like hits home. Mm -hmm. but I always say like, you know, from from like the travel ball perspective, from you know like when I was coaching D three, like there wasn't ton of movement, right? Like there wasn't like people weren't leaving, like you know like the transfer portal, like the one time transfer rule wasn't a thing, like it wasn't trendy to like find a school, commit, and then decommit. Like mm -hmm. it was a pain. Yeah, it wasn't it, worth the fight. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely not. And like 
to your point, Andy, like, yeah, I, I went from a JUCO to a D3 to a D2. I would have stayed at that D3 if I could afford it. Right. Like, mm. but it was my fault because I didn't do the appropriate research that I needed in order to like execute, like, you know, like how much money do I have left over outside of what scholarship, academic scholarship, um, you know, grants and loans are going to offer me. Mm. And, but you know, what I think is great is, um, and, and it's often overlooked in, and I just actually wrote a newsletter about it is like, it's, the status isn't the be all end all. Like we need to stop talking about status and we start talking about what's the authenticity of the kid. And, and most kids, especially now with social media, I can't imagine getting recruited in this space, but like what now, like why, how can we tell kids that like, it's still cool to go NAIA. It's still cool to go D3. Like, and in college athletics, like I saw this tweet and it went completely viral. This woman was like, Hey, I'm a tax, um, I'm now a tax attorney. Um, and I do people's taxes for a living. And I promise you, they never asked me if I was a D1 athlete. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was, I was like, say less. <clears throat> no. Yeah. So as we transition to that, um tell me corbin a little bit about naia like like the recruiting benefits um of naia and then maybe like preconceived notions and why it's a great choice yeah so um i've been an nai lifer <laughs> you could say because i played in the nai coached in the nai um the nai is for the player right and i think um a lot of people don't, well, first off, they don't know what the NAI is, but um, the NAI is just another governing body, just like the NCAA. Obviously, it's much smaller. Um, I think we have between 250 and 300 schools maybe in the NAI. Um, but when I say like it's for the player, like it is designed um, for the student athlete to not be restricted like they are with the NCAA, okay. right? No matter what you do in the NCAA, like it has to be reported, documented, like the whole nine yards, um, and so in the NAI, like we're, I don't want to say that we're free to do what we want, but as long as we're within our, our weeks of competition, our start dates, our end dates, like, I mean, we're, we're pretty much like full go. Um, I love the fact that I don't have to document every single phone call that I make, uh, every single text message, every single email. Um, I truly feel like during my recruiting process, like I can get to know the player and start building that player coach relationship on our own terms. Um, there's no quiet period. There's no dead period. Like um, it, it's a, a true um, like fluid process um, from start to finish. Um, and so to be honest, like that's why I, I love the NAI. Some of the notions are like, again, schools are in the middle of nowhere. No, they're not, not all the time. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of school or a lot of kids or families think NAI schools can't give money. Well, they can. Or maybe they don't have any money. Well, you show up to Georgia Gwinnett and you'll see money. You yep. know what? I mean? yep. like, they think that there's no competition um, yeah. until you see players like Annalise Jarvis at Gwinnett. Um, mm -hmm. I'm convinced she could pitch on any staff in America. You mm -hmm. know, you see a player like Bailey Phillips, who's the best, um, who is one of the best pitchers in our conference. I think she could pitch on any D1 staff. Um, Emily Loveless at Reinhardt, like, leadoff hitter, shortstop. I, I'm truly convinced she could play anywhere in power five, like somewhere she could find a spot. Um, and again, I, I just think that people are, I don't want to use the word ignorant. I just, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's you see it. And until you see the teams, until you practice with a team and you watch fall games, like then you, you really don't realize like how good it is until you've seen it. Um, and so again, like as the game's progressing, um, Reagan and the guys with NAI ball, um, that's on the baseball side. They now have NAI SB promote, promoting the brand, like on Twitter and stuff. Um, and obviously the more that it grows, the more people are going to be informed. I love, I wish. You ever heard of Andy? <laughs> huh? <laughs> I don't have it. I don't have a regret because here's my thing. Like JUCO, like I, I put JUCO and NAIA, they're cousins. Yeah. You know, and, and I, and I could be wrong, but I think that NAIA was around before NCAA. 
It could be. I mean, it's old. I could be real. I could be wrong, but I'm. I know stupid things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I I have some kids. Uh, I got one kid at a uh, Saint Xavier in Chicago. She loves it. Like you know, she's going to nursing school. She got a scholarship. She's a pitcher. Like you know, and and uh, in Iowa, like we got Saint Ambrose. That's probably the only one I can probably name, but. Some great NAI softball in the Midwest. Oh, Yeah. great, great Yeah. NAI. Oh, who else? Uh, Col is it Culver Stockton? That Oklahoma City, Central Oklahoma Method. City. I had a, I had some teammates that transferred. Oklahoma City Stars. Yep, yep. Rebecca Klingen Smith at Cotty is is doing a tremendous job at that program. Um, there's some really good programs. There are some really good programs, and like I said, you know. you you hit a spot on is like you don't want to call it ignorant but again like you can't get mad about somebody that doesn't you can't get mad at someone that doesn't have the right information Yeah. right because it's so easy especially with social media and mom and dad are on and they're like oh my god my daughter's going to georgia Yeah. so you know <laughs> yeah. you know what we say in in my space we talk about it's all cool it's cool when your mom can wear the sweatshirt at the mall right like Mm. your mom knows the school or the people that that look at your mom's sweatshirt they know the school that that you're talking about right um and it's super unfortunate cuz you know i have a lot of, i have a lot of athletes who um and like i i i'm going to be honest with you like when you look at like my recruiting journey like had i been open like had i not been um I don't want to say convinced, but like, had it D1 go not been like the cool thing, I, I probably would have been a little bit more open. Like the, the school that I ended up coaching at my second year D3 at Cornell college, like they recruited me when I was in high school, like Shannon Ness. We played them this year. Yeah. So Yeah. Shannon Ness. Rams. Yeah. The Rams. Yeah. Uh, Shannon Ness was one of the, um, she was at Gus Davis and they went to the national championship in D3. She ended up taking over Cornell College. Um, now she's at Occidental. She's at AD now. But like the program was fantastic. It was one class at a time. It was everything I wanted. Like I, I saw myself at, academically there, like small school, close to Iowa City, like not, you know, perfect. But I like saw all my friends going to these D1 schools. Like I was in a, I think it was, yeah, 4A. I think, yeah, 4A Illinois school. And we, you know, like, we had some pretty talented kids the four years that I was there. I would say on average, we had, you know, four years I was there, probably three kids each class go division one. So it was like, cool. Right. And I was like, yeah, how do I do that? My parents were first generation. I was a first generation college student. My dad went to college, but never graduated college, he, you know? So like you look at like the, like you said, the ignorance of, or not ignorance, but what I didn't know was like, Mm. Okay, I could get college paid for at Division One school. Like, I didn't even know what NAI was. Mm -hmm. And that's the un, like that's the unfortunate part is like I spoke to an athlete, and it's funny you bring up Reinhardt University. Is like Reinhardt University reaches out to her and is like, "Yo, like we want you on campus." And I told her I was like, "Like you, yeah, you might want to go to this Division One school, but this Division One school might offer you less because you're a stellar student and a, an incredible pitcher, right? Like." Right. Reinhardt University might offer you more, right? Um, but it's like society is trendy. Like, and unfortunately, people don't talk about the NAIA schools, right? They talk Yeah. about you being a thing, but they don't talk about the NAIA schools. They Yeah. don't talk about you until they need you. Yeah. 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 What's what I, I always tell my assistants, um, you know, they're all young first time coaches and, um, what I always tell them, like I have a recruiting plan that we put in place for our staff from, from the first call, the first message to the day they sign their LOI. Like we have an exact process that we follow. And, um, we are very much not a staff that is like commit to us or you're dead to us. I can't tell you how many kids between baseball and softball, the course of my coaching career have said no, but have gone on to other places. It hasn't worked out. Sure. And came And back. who's the first person they call? You. The last person that respected them. Yes. And there's so many coaches, right. That operate in this space of, 
if you don't commit to us, like we're done. Don't ever call me. Don't text me. Like, yeah. Like, and, and again, and I don't know if it's ego driven or like, I, I, tr I do believe like you have to walk away from some kids with some dignity, but like showing that mutual respect is what they want. And sometimes the kids don't even know what they want. Yeah. Now, they don't know what they want and they yeah. make the wrong choice. Like that's just part of the process, but you also have to remain constant and know that they might be making the wrong choice, but you could get them the second time around. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's worked a ton, a ton. Um, and I'm excited again for the next calendar year to start getting those phone calls with some of those girls that I was recruiting that ended up going to other spots mm -hmm. because I know it's coming at some point. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. And I think that's just like a life lesson too. Like it doesn't, it, it's, you know, you, we always talk about don't burn bridges. Like that is essentially like, who knows you might not be there forever you might go somewhere else yeah. and be like, Hey, I remembered you. We had a great relationship. You're yep. unhappy. Look at this opportunity, yeah. you know, whatever, not saying, you know, where you're at, isn't, you know, yeah. good. For my, them, center but... fielder, my center fielder, um, her name's Amaya Hernandez. She was at Iowa Western. Um, I think she was an all American Iowa Western second teamer. She's good. college. Yeah. She's really good. The Reavers. Uh, yes. The River Pirates. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know. Her. Um, so <laughs> she followed her coach down to Daytona state. Okay. Uh, finished Juco, ends up going to Rollins College in Orlando. Mm -hmm. it didn't work out. Um, her brother played baseball for us at Montreat like four years ago. They're from Sterling, Illinois. Mm -hmm. and so um, he just hit me up when he was like, hey, coach, like, I know we haven't talked in a while, but um, like, do you need an outfielder? And I was like, I don't know. Is she good? And he, just, <laughs> like, and he was like, look at her stats. She hit like 400 with 22 homers in two years. And um, like, she just wasn't in a great spot that fit her. Right. Mm -hmm. She comes in at the break. I think she hit almost 400 or she did hit 400. Um, in my opinion, she was the best defender in the conference. Um, obviously I'm a little biased, but <laughs> like you're talking about a kid who had went from a Juco to a Juco to a four year. And now she's saying like, Oh my goodness. Like, mm -hmm. what did I do? Right. And so she comes in at the break, but had I never nurtured that relationship with her brother, sure. I would have never got her in a, in a totally different profession. Oh, uh, totally. and so again, like relationships matter. Like I can't tell you how many times, like, especially when I first got this job that I called buddies, uh, like that coach baseball, I'm like, yo, who do you know that coaches softball in this part of the country? Yep. And I started with my wife's best friend. And so you guys know, like I'm big on West Coasters. Um, yeah. My wife is from Spirit Lake, Idaho, played at Spokane Falls Community College, and then we met at Southeastern. Okay. Um, her best friend, her name's Lindsay Sawinski, um, was one of the one of the best pitchers in NWAC history. Um, she was the NAI record holder for wins, innings pitched, strikeouts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Until decorated. Annalise, yeah. Until Annalise Jarvis came along and absolutely just. Yeah. Said who? <laughs> so when I got this job, I called, I called Lindsay. She was the pitching coach at Spokane Falls. And I said, Hey, like, I don't know anybody, um, like put me onto some kids. And she said, well, I've, we've got a shortstop that's uncommitted from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, end up signing her first baseman from Seattle, Michaela Reed. I ended up signing her. Um, and then just networking, right. I said, Lindsay, mm -hmm. like somebody in the conference that you love, you truly respect. She said, you know, you need to call this coach. So I called Logan at Walla Walla, ended up signing his right fielder, Holly Cunningham. And then I said, Logan, who's somebody you love? Like you, you talk to a lot. He's like, you got to call Mike down to Antelope Valley. I ended up landing two kids from Antelope Valley down in California. And it's just this revolving door of just networking, building relationships. Um, and so again, like what I tell kids all the time is like, you, you truly, you never know who's watching. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, like I've spoken to a coach where a coach will say, coach, like, we don't need this kid, but they can help somebody. Maddie Armstrong um, is the pitching coach, associate head coach at Western Carolina down here. Um, one of the best softball minds I've spoken to. Um, I called her and I said, Hey, I need a catcher. Like I need a catcher bad. She said, here's this left-handed hitting catcher out of South Carolina. Like, you need to get this girl. She could play for you. Um, the girl ended up going to a D2 school, but we went through the process with her. Mm -hmm. Like, and so, but it all started because that kid showed Maddie respect. Sure. And so, like the the coaching carousel is so small. The salt. Oh the my god. Is so tight, and so like, 
I always tell girls like whether it works out here with us or or somewhere else or wherever you end up, like always be open minded because you don't know where your journey is going to lead you. Mm hmm. No, 100%. Like one of my professors is, I was upset about something. He's like, a book has many chapters. And I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. But no, it, it is. It's about, you know, especially when I have had to deal with my kids, like I had one that she was going to transfer. Uh, she was transferring from a D1, committed to a D3. And then she called me two weeks ago and she goes, listen, I feel bad that I'm saying this, but like, I don't think I want to play anymore. And I just want to finish out my degree at this JUCO and then like start my internship. And I was like, okay. She's like, I'm sorry. I was like, why are you saying sorry? She's like, I just feel bad. I was like, for what? For starting your life? Like Yeah. at the end of the day, I feel great that you can call me and we can have this conversation and you can still call that coach. Like that coach might be dis like disappointed. Like obviously like you're a good player and you, you know, we're going to help them win. But At the end of the day, like if you have a good relationship with them, who cares? Like you might look down the road and be like, hey, can I help coach? Hey, can I do this? Like it's seriously about networking and how you treat people. And you never you never know when you're going to need. Some Yeah. Yeah. But sorry, we kind of went down a rabbit hole, but back to like the notions of the NAI, like, I mean, the, the opportunities are just, are, are so amazing across the board. Um, but I also think coaches have to educate players. Like um, my kids make fun of me because they say we're bougie and I'm bougie. Um, but like we, we stay in Hilton hotels and we stay in Hyatt's and like, Mm. Yeah, you do, coach. we, we, you we travel go. a lot. You should that you should you Correct. I I believe in that. Like I totally believe that you sleep well, you feel safe, you at least have some clear water in the bathroom. Like I Yeah. do call life, baby. I've slept on floors. Like Yeah, I that stuff matters to me. And so for yeah. me, I mean, we we don't we don't have an Oklahoma budget, but like sure. when I ask them to fundraise, right? And we go we do all of these things through the fall, the email campaigns, we work events, we do all this stuff like Nobody likes when they fundraise and they don't see anything for it. And so for us, when we take a week long trip to Florida for spring break and we stay at a home two suites by Hilton and they're comfortable, like that's where their money's going. Instead of eating McDonald's, like we're eating Chipotle or we go to Outback or Texas Roadhouse or like, you know what I mean? Just the overall player experience, like increasing that because your players are billboards for your program. Mm -hmm. Oh, for And sure. I've always said this, right? Like your players are your best recruiters. I can't Right. tell you how many times, like I've had a player that we've given them a great experience to, we've taken care of them. And they say, Hey coach, I got a friend over here or Hey coach, like I know this girl, she needs a home. Like you have to give your players the best possible experience you can because they're going to turn around and they're going to pay you back 10 times fold. It might not be in wins and losses. It might not be in fundraising dollars, but like from start to finish over the, like the grand scheme of things, like they're going to give you back everything that you gave them. Mm So, -hmm. oh yeah I firmly believe like I, I would teach my kids like you get what you give yeah. you get what you give like there's it's a two-way street like I'm never gonna not pour into you and expect you know I'm never gonna not show up halfway and then expect you to give me like everything you have like I'm gonna come in guns a blazing you better come back ready firing back at me and 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 that's just the physical part but also too like when I say like I do this to myself I remember talking to my kids I said you see a piece of trash you pick it up And the other day I was in the parking lot and I was with my wife and I saw a piece of trash and I literally like felt like my whole team was staring at me. Like in the back of my head, I was like, I got to pick that piece of trash Mm -hmm. Yeah. up. Yeah. Our AD, like one of his things is like, we're trash men and women, like pick it up, like take care of your stuff. But, um, you know, back to it, like, I, I truly believe that coaches, um, they need to lay it out for kids and tell them like, Here's what our travel experience looks like. Here's what our player development looks like. Here's what our weightlifting and nutrition plan looks like. Mm. Adidas school. Here's the gear you get. Like I even have it put up in my office with gloves and cleats and like, you know, as close to D1 as I can get it to where they are like, wait, I get a glove like that. Um, and, and that stuff matters. Like, should it matter? Probably not. No, but But it's who you're competing against, right? Correct. And again, Yeah. like, We, we want them to feel like they're the best. Mm -hmm. Um, again, no matter if you're division one, two, three, JUCO, like wherever you're going, like we, again, coaches, their goal should be to create the best environment and the best player experience that they can provide.
You know, what's funny, Corbin, is like after I met you and we talked for the first time, I was like, you know what? I'm going to like I'm ignorant to know about like the the in-depth data that that coincides with NAI. Right. So um, I posted this long tweet and I was like, you know what? Like, I want to know how many conferences there are. I want to know how many softball teams there are, how much money is associated with NAI athletes. I want to know what types of divisions, how do they correlate with the NCAA? And I'm pulling the tweet up right now because I remember you did put it out. Yeah. So so the the slogan is maximizing your return on athletics, right? And so I, I did it softball specific, which was 198 NAI schools that offer softball, 21 conferences. NAIA total is 65,000 students, 25 national championships, 250 total colleges and universities, like you mentioned, Division One, Division Two, which I looked at, and they're saying that most Division One and Division Two NAI affiliates are comparable to most Division One, Division Two NCAA affiliates. And then 20% of athletes play at the national level postseason. 79% of them qualify for national championships. And there's 83,000 NAI student athletes that have opportunity to play at college sports, earning $1.3 billion in scholarship. So the only, the only difference is, and, and I love you mentioned your faith base, right? Cause I think there's a lot of athletes that, that, that lack the ability. They, they look for, you know, you're, you're not going to find a program like Oklahoma who is all encompassing face bait. Right. Mm. But what I will say is like what I posted was like roughly 82% are private and 65% are faith based. Mm -hmm. Like whether or not that correlates. And, and I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, like most of them are Christianity affiliated, right? Like, so like what better to feel like home than to go to an NAI school I just spoke to a catcher that went to Montana um, who was 26 K in debt after she was on scholarship, academic and athletic. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I don't, she's like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my student loans. Like I don't have the, like, I don't have a regular income. And I was like, well, Hey, I can talk you through this. There is an income driven, but that doesn't make that debt go away. No, like it doesn't make it go away. So like, all these people are like this D one or bus mentality of like, I had another athlete who was offered a D uh, well, I should say wasn't offered offered to come to a camp with her GPA alone. She gets $7,500 a year. That's not to include the athletic scholarship. Like you were talking about stacking. That's include the athletic scholarship grants that she receives, maybe outside scholarship, like stacking is a real thing. Yeah. So like when you're talking about like I go to an NAI school, like I could play I could pay zero to nothing. Like mm -hmm. I mean could. Yeah. Could, could. Like if if I'm doing my due diligence of doing outside scholarships, grants, et cetera, my family applies for FAFSA, we're in a good space to receive the appropriate mm -hmm. grants. Like, I mean, I'm looking at like my D2 experience where I got a University of Minnesota degree at a division two school. But bounced around JUCO, I didn't pay anything. Division that division three school I went to, like, yeah, I obtained like some debt. My grad degree, my grad degree, where I was a GA, I still struggled because I was taking out school loans to live. Yeah. Right. Totally normal. <laughs> yeah, totally normal. So I went from yep. twenty thousand dollars of student loans to thirty thousand dollars because. I wanted to be a GA and I want to be a, a college coach. Because you have to have your master's. Yeah, you have to have your master's. Yeah. Right? Like, but one year that I'm there, I take out $10,000 in loans just to live because I can't have another job. Yep. Right? Like, the reality is there. Like, if I could go back and do it all over again, like, I'm thinking, I had the small school experience. Like, I, the D3 I went to, the town was 2,000 people. Wolf. We had a McDonald's, a gas station, and we had to drive 30 minutes north or 30 minutes south to get to, like, 
and I was cool with it. Yeah. Couldn't afford it. Like, yeah. yeah. And so like, I'm very, um, I'm very like 50, 50 on, on the whole, like money loans, like, um, for me personally. Okay. Yep. I believe that every single kid should take out a student loan to some degree. Sure. Fair. The, That's kid that. need, the kid needs skin in the game. Yep. yep. I can't tell you how many kids I've seen, or maybe you guys have played with or coach where mom and dad stroke a check, pay for school. They skip class. They have nothing invested. Oh. And so, um, for me, like NAIs are just like D ones. You could go to Stanford and pay a hundred grand a year or Miami or 50 grand a year or George Gwinnett is $6,000 a year, like whatever it is. Right. So for me, what I'm explaining, like bang for buck, right. You have to ask yourself, like meaning the student athlete, like what is it worth to you? Mm -hmm. Right. What's it worth to you? The kid that comes in and says, coach, like I want to be a communications major, I think I want to do like a, you know, I want to be an Instagram photographer. I'm telling them like, well, don't spend 48 grand a year to come to Montreat, right? <laughs> like, but then yeah. I'll turn around and I'll have kids. Like I sat with the kid today and she said, coach, I want to, I want to be a kinesiology major, exercise science. Like I'm going to get an internship. Like this degree is going to pay me tenfold. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So for her, obviously after aid and scholarships, I don't know what it's going to cost her, but she's sure. still be paying quite a bit. Sure. It's worth it for her. Cybersecurity is a huge one for us. Oh, um, yep. Cy we we have we just won a sixty million dollar um, grant from the government to build like this huge cyber hub. Wow! Uh, and kids are coming from all over the country to study cybersecurity here. Now, let's just say they're taking out a loan of their. Let's just say their their loans are twenty grand a year. Mm -hmm. They're eighty thousand dollars in debt when they leave Montreal, but when they graduate and their job pays them one fifty in year one, yeah. Fine. They're not worried. Yeah. Right. And so like, I, I I just think like, one, what are you going to do for a career? But two, what value are you placing in it? Mm -hmm. right? Like how important is your faith to you if you come to Montreat? And so for us, we're open enrollment. So you don't have to be a Christian to attend Montreat. And right. I love our administration so much because our president, um, he was a D1 soccer player at Cincinnati. Like this dude is a winner, like cares about the kids, the coaches, and he kind of transformed, like, in our eyes, what does it mean to be a student athlete at a Christian school? Like, the first thing you think of in Christian schools is, like, they're slapping you over the head with a Bible. Here's your book of rules. Like, be in your room by eight. Like, no drinking. Like, the whole thing. And so he's really changed this notion for us of, like, we want our kids to come here and have the expectation of, like, you're a student athlete. You shouldn't drink because it's against the law unless you're 21 and you're off campus. All right. You shouldn't smoke because you need to pass a drug test to play collegiately. Like that's what you sign up for. Common we go sense. To, yeah, Common we sense. go to convocation once a month as a team, which yep. is our cap, like once sure. a month. And so for me, like I want to nurture a culture where our girls can pursue their faith as much as they want or mm -hmm. as little as they want. But mm -hmm. they're never going to say like, I didn't have the opportunity. Sure. We have a coach. His name's Marty Burgess through Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He yes. comes on Wednesdays. He's amazing. And he talks to them about like how to be a high level athlete, how to be a high level person. How do you tie your faith into that? And so for okay. me, like, I always tell the girls and I told them today in our first team meeting, I said, like, my job is not to save your soul. I can't like your parents can't softball can't. My job is just for you to look at me and say, okay, how does coach like like, how does he operate? Like, why does he treat his wife so well? Like, why does he love his kids? Like, why does he do this for us? Well, I'm just covered in grace. That's all it is, right? And that, and that's just for me. But again, like, whether they pursue Christ or not at our institution, they're going to know that they're loved. They're mm -hmm. going to know that they're cared for. They're going to be able to leave Montreal and say, like, I am the best version of myself because of the opportunities that I got within that program. Um, and that's huge for me. Like, Again, when they leave, it's it's all about being the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like the religion portion of that can be the biggest piece. It can be the smallest piece. Like that's not up for me to decide. But again, like we we nurture a culture where winning is not everything, right? And I want to win. Believe me, I I I want to win bad, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to win and sacrifice who I am as a man. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to win and sacrifice, like, my love for my players, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to win 
and people don't respect us. Yep. And that's a huge thing for me. And a lot of people, they dig, they don't understand that concept, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when, or obviously you're fired. And at Montreal, excuse me, like, I don't feel this overbearing weight of winning a national championship or you're fired. Like mm -hmm. winning on tree and for us is just one piece of what we do. Like we want you to be a decent person. We want you to be a great student. We want you to be a great athlete. We want you to, to, to have a great social life. Like those things are so important for me. Like, mm -hmm. and again, I'm, I'm only 30, which 30, but like. Join the uh, club. It's okay. I, I know. And so for me, like, I try to care as much about the things that they care about as I do softball. Mm -hmm. I ask them like, how's your boyfriend or how's your girlfriend or like, mm -hmm. how's your parents or like, Hey, did you see this new song that Drake just dropped? Or like <laughs> did you see this TikTok video? Well, like, and that's how you develop that mutual respect. Right? Like right. it's so you never want it to feel transactional. Right. And, and you, and some of the kids that have a bad experience, those relationships with those coaches are transactional. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so like what I've found is um, the more that I focus on them off the field, the better that they perform on 100%. It. And so, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say I did the best job of this last year, but it's something that I'm really working on is like coaches that yell and scream and go nuts are the ones that are least confident in how they prepare their teams. Mm -hmm. so for me, like if you show up to one of our games, like I, I don't say very much, like we're coaching ins and outs or defensive positioning and stuff like that. But like, we're not giving instruction. Sure. Like we're letting them do their thing. Like, yep. I think coaches that, that don't trust their player development piece or their practice or like how they prepare are the ones that like, they go crazy, yep. you know? Uh, but again, back to like, the more you care for them and the more you love them and you pour into them as people, the better players they become. Mm-hmm. Hey, Andy, do you want to go to Montreal? Yeah, I do. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I can still, I played a hell of a game slow yeah. the other day. Like, How I still got it. Eligibility. Uh, yeah, I still got it. Or, you know, if you hiring. take 33 year old players. At no, if you're hiring, I, I mean, I buy in my values. We can, yeah. we can compare philosophies here. I feel like we're pretty spot on. Can you move yeah. Montreal to Park City, Utah? <laughs> yeah. Or, or Wisconsin. You can go to Wisconsin. No, no one wants to go to Wisconsin, Andy. No, I don't want to go to Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Have you been? I've driven through it. It's okay because I'm from but, Iowa, so it's okay. fine. Corbin, anytime you're in Park City, Utah, you just let me know because you'll be. Yeah, I haven't been. That Utah is like one of the only places I haven't been. I was really close to landing a girl from Utah this year. Um, mm -hmm. She ended up in Arizona, but uh, it's a hidden gem. But, I I really respect um, like literally everything you said, mostly because sure. I feel like I feel like. Um, and actually, like I said, I'm going to revert back to the newsletter is um, that I just put out was, um, you know, like I authentically was like, hey, this was me. And I was living a life that people wanted me to live and or mm -hmm. the standard that people wanted me to be at rather than the standard I hold myself to. Um, and that absolutely matters. Um, I coach a very um, I coach soccer lacrosse I shouldn't say lacrosse but I coach soccer athletes or basketball athletes that want to be softball players like I don't coach softball players at the high school I coach at and but the greatest thing is you know like I know that the you know with high school like I don't get a recruit or right? like I get the cream of the crop right and and what I would say is I told them I said you know if we're going to stand for anything we're going to stand for I'm going to teach you to be strong women and I'm going to teach you to be uh, good students and I'm going to teach you to be best version of yourself that you can be. If, if some team, which actually happened, acts like Florida and we walk a, a run in from third to home and they steal second, we're okay with that because we know we're not that team, especially when we're up 17 runs. Right. Um, and, and if we will lose, we're going to lose with respect. And we're going to be a team with good sportsmanship. And I'm going to teach these women how to be better, stronger women. And I love that, that you touch on that because I, I truly believe that um, the authenticity of that does not always speak through all programs and mm -hmm. kind of like, Hey, you're here for softball and that's pretty much it. Um, but that's what I love about small programs. I say small as in like, 
uh, like small schools. Uh, the oh, okay. Yeah, the authenticity yeah. You get with a Division two, Division three NAI school um, that you, I don't want to say you won't get a Division one school, but um, you know when you spoke to class sizes, you spoke to teacher to you know student ratio, et cetera. Like, well, and there's a slightly more pressure to win. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Slight, I, I say slight. Well, it depends on the sport too. Like you know, you and it's not even five. hidden. It's not even hidden anymore. Yeah. You know I mean? Before it was a lot of that stuff was behind closed doors, and sure. now it's not. like it's yeah. Now reports are in. Thing. Yeah, you didn't win. Um, you you got like six fifty. You know, winning percentage. You're out. Like yeah, yeah. Actually, one thing that um that I like you said on your newsletter, and um we had our first like culture meeting today and, and the three yeah. pillars in our, in our program are faith, accountability, and resiliency, like faith in each other. Um, mm -hmm. you know, being accountable for the things, you know, that, that you want to be accountable for. And so what I like to do is we're going to do this exercise next week is, as I ask them, like, what do you want to be held accountable for? Mm -hmm. I have a dry race board and we, and they, they call things out and I write them down. And so when they're late for practice and I send them home, like, I'm just holding them to you the standard. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. The best programs are always player led. Mm -hmm. Like let the players have a voice. Let 100%. Them, right? um, and so like the third piece that our, you know, our pillars is resiliency. And at the very last question that I put on our PowerPoint today um, was whose dream are you chasing? Mm -hmm. Is it your dream or is it your parents' dream? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I, I like to get them interacting a lot. And so I asked them, I said, if you at any point in your softball career, like played the game solely because your parents wanted you to raise your hand, every person in our program raised their hand. And, and so like, and it was kind of one of those like aha moments where the light bulb went off. And, and so I, I brought that full circle and saying like, are you chasing your own dream? Like, is this what you want? Or are you only doing this because someone else wanted you to? Like, are you so busy, like, gazing at Division One that, like, you're missing your own opportunity? Mm -hmm. I just had – I have a Division One pitcher that transferred in, um, and she's a grad student, and she's been to four schools and, like, girl. Just, just bad luck kind of everywhere that followed yeah. her. And, you know, um, and, and I was talking to her today, and it's – she, you know, she said, like – like kids, they want to go D1 and they want to do this and they want to do that, but they don't realize like what they see on TV is not what you get everywhere. No. Right. And so I, I always like, I would encourage you guys to use that with your athletes. Like whose dream are you chasing? Like, oh, for it's sure. Truly your dream to mm -hmm. be the college athlete, like to go to class and be better than your parents. I'm a first generation college graduate too. Like mm -hmm. first person to be an athlete, first person to leave home, like the whole thing. And so like, I can honestly sit here and say like baseball wasn't always my dream, but mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I continued with it because like, sure. I, you know, yeah, yeah, no, you use, and some people are, you know, you use it as a vessel. It's yeah. your vessel to get out. And like, I get that. And, and some people are lucky to fall and be really good at it and, and chase their passion with that. But yeah, it is, it can be a vessel and I totally get that. Yeah. And so for me, like, um, I think I have like 17, I don't know the exact number, like West Coasters, meaning Texas West, mm -hmm. Texas, Arizona, Colorado, California, um, Idaho, Washington. Far from home. Far. Mm -hmm. And so like, I love, love, love recruiting kids far from home because like when they come here, they have no choice but to be immersed. Mm -hmm. the, kids that I have, the kids that I have the most trouble with are the ones closest to home Yep. because they're so quick to run home to mom and dad. They're so oh, quick yeah. to to their boyfriend or their girlfriend or that high school football game yep. or homecoming or that prom. And like, well, it for, keeps them from growing up. It keeps them yeah. from being their own identity. Yes. And so for yeah. me, like part of, you know, loving to recruit transfers, but like, I always like, I've got, I would say of those kids, I would say half of those now are high school kids from far away. And for every kid that I land from the West coast that comes here out of high school, I have 10 of them that say, coach, I can't go that far. Mm. Like, and that's okay. But like, again, the maturity that you see in, um, in, in the high school freshman that comes over here from a, a far distance, like if you look at them in one calendar year, they're usually so far ahead of the kid that's within two hours of home, mm -hmm. right? Because like they're, they're socially, they develop, like mm -hmm. they get over that homesickness, like they don't have a, but 
right? Independence. They don't have a choice but to spread their wings. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a player from Spokane, Mackenzie Ritchie, and she's going to be a sophomore this year. And I absolutely adore this kid. Like, I love her. Um, and we were eating dinner, like, last summer. Um, we were at this little bistro, super cool spot. And um, her dad's, like, actively telling me, like, yeah, coach, I don't want her to come here. Like, it's too far. Like, I don't want her here. Dad gets up to go to the bathroom, and she looks at me. She's like, don't worry, coach. I'll be here. <laughs> like, Mom busts out laughing. Like, she ended up signing. Um, she came here, had an incredible freshman year, um, played a bigger role kind of towards the end and she's back for, as a sophomore, but like the emotional, so like the emotional maturity that she shows, like it's something that you don't really get in, in a lot mm-hmm. of high school freshmen. Um, and I just credit that to one, she has amazing parents, but two, like she came here, like roomed with a junior, like hung out with the older kids. And so the transition was just so much easier. Mm-hmm. Now she made her own mistakes, obviously, and she grew, but like, um, but for me, like I, I wish kids would just take a chance and just go, mm-hmm. just go. And here's what I tell them too. Like home's not going anywhere. And I promise every single kid this, if you come here and you're that miserable, I will help you go somewhere closer to home. Like I'll pick up the phone and I will call those coaches and vouch for you. Like, but you need to take a chance. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's better to go somewhere and it not work out and you go home than you live the rest of your life saying, man, like what if wish I would have just tried it. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, we've got a very diverse roster. I love our girls. Like um, it's very normal for them to watch my kids and hang out with my wife. And like, yeah. and I mm-hmm. love that. This is, this is for me, it's just nurturing a culture of family. Like we are all we have. I moved mm-hmm. here with my wife. I have no family here. She has no family here. Like my team is my family. Like, mm-hmm. and I, I leave for the summer because it's so lonely. Mm-hmm. Like, I want them to always know, like our office doors open. We have a 24 hour open door policy in the office. Like mm-hmm. come in any day at one o'clock, one of the players is sleeping on the couch in the office. It's just, it's just what it is. And it's yeah. about getting that level of comfort. Safe. Right. Safe. It's a safe space for them. And again, mm-hmm. that translates to winning. It always translates to winning because if they can't trust me and I can't trust them, like, how is this going to work? It's not. Yeah, it won't. It, just, it never works. Yeah. Um, and so again, like we, we do, I, I screw up a lot of things. Like nobody's perfect, but the one thing that we have like down pat is culture and love and like creating a space like where they feel empowered. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell you what. So I love what you said about giving the players a choice because <clears throat> that's one thing I loved about Bluffton. Um, when I went to that G3 school, my sophomore year, um, Heather Bruder, they were twins, Holly Bruder coach at Moorhead State, um, later coach Lamar, both out of coaching now. But what I will say is, um, we had the tap out rule, which was, um, like if Andy and I were teammates and I was like, yo, you're just, you're, you're distant from where I need you to be. You're not at practice. You tap, you tap that player out and they leave. And Mm -hmm. you got a choice as a team. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. One of the hardest things, hardest things I've ever done, right? Like um, she held the program to a high standard, but you look at like, I mean, you look up Heather Bruder right now on Google, you're going to come up with a video of, of our captains being like, yeah, at the end of the day, like, you know, she loves you. Like she's hard on you, but she knows that no matter what she loves you. I mean, my car was broken down in Ohio and I didn't have anybody but my teammates and I called coach and I was like, yo, my car is broken down. And she's like, I- I'll come over, picks me up, drives me to her house, fix my car. And then I remember specifically being like, oh, we got to go to Walmart to get this part. And, and she, and I was driving around and she was like, what are you driving around for? There's parking spots right back, back, back there. And she, and I was like, well, I'm trying to find a close parking spot. And she's like, no, we will never take the easy way out. We'll, you park wherever you find a parking spot. It might be in the back, but you're going to walk from the back of the parking spot. And to this day, I still don't care where I park. You know what I mean? Like it's those aha moments of like, I talk about that coach that made a difference in my life because we got a choice. Like yeah. you're going to be whoever we wanted to be. Like we, you know, you show up to class, you be accountable, you represent the softball team with respect and dignity, dignity, yeah. but at the end of the day, like we will do, we would coach would be like, Hey, jump off this bridge and be like, which one? Mm-hmm. Because we believe that no matter what, at the end of that, like 
there was nothing dangerous down there. And I think it's super awesome that you create that experience for your kids because not a lot of people experience that. And what I will say is, is like, when can I sign up to go play a Xava Facts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and like I said, we're not perfect. We, we screw up a lot of stuff. And, yeah, sure. um, but again, like I, I trust, I try to really operate in a space of like, I will never ask our players to do things that I won't do myself. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I still do the laundry and I help with the laundry. Like why? Because I'm going to ask them to do it. And I enjoy doing it. If we, if we don't do the laundry, right. They can't play and they can't win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have pretty, in-depth like practice plans is posted before practice on our group chat they know what's going on like um they're holding me accountable just like i'm holding them accountable um and so i i really love that about what we do so yeah it's fantastic i i love it like i think um people would be i don't want to say stupid but people would be very very um they would not they would not get the opportunity that they potentially get for not playing for your program um, there's not, what you do is very unique and, and Andy can attest to this too. Like, you know, as, as boisterous and young college coach that I was, um, holding Andy accountable, there was never a time where I was like, I'll, I won't beat you in a race. Like a, a thousand percent, I'll beat you in a race. Like yeah. you'll never I'll, beat me in a race. I'll show you what a text, but how often did I show you like, Oh yeah, no, you, you led by example. Yeah. yeah. I'll show you what a Texas leaker looks like. Mm-hmm. I'll show you what it, it looks like to run down a ball correctly. Yeah. And, and I'm going to hold you accountable for not, um, you know, calling off and Andy will tell this story to like, to this day, she still tells this stupid story about how I called her. I was like, why'd you not call off that middle infielder? You're running in, they're running back. And she's like, she caught it. And I was like, I don't care. You know what I, was I mean? Having a bad day, coach. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing is, is like, I, you know, like I would no, never- I yeah, I never forget that. And those are things that you know, they'll stay with you forever. Yeah, yeah I remember. So my sophomore year at Southeastern, we had a GA that came from Florida, um, and he came fresh off that 2012 national championship team with like Pete Alonzo, Mike Zanino, like you know, big names, and and I remember he was like. I mean, this guy was just like a jerk and we're actually friends now. He coached baseball, Reinhardt. And so, um, I got kicked out of the weight room because I got a drink of water at the wrong time. <laughs> and I picked up the phone. I called our head coach. I'm going nuts. Tell him I'm quitting. Like I'm packing my stuff. And like, <laughs> I was so angry at the time. And now I look back and I'm like, I get it. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like that specific instructions of what he wanted done. I didn't follow it. It wasn't about the waters because I didn't mm-hmm. follow the instructions. Yeah. It's still as stupid as I think it is. Like that was a championship culture. Like yeah. you, you did what was asked of you. And so mm-hmm. um, I, I totally, that's, that's my moment. Like you're talking about. So, um, and my players have a lot of those too, that they'll be laughing about at their weddings and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. <laughs> so you, still t- you always talk about the hard moments, the, the yeah. hard moments, like that's people don't get is, like no one talks about like the the times things were easy. Like yeah. they talk about like how they overcame an obstacle. They talk about the time that the coach got in in their butt about doing something stupid or doing stuff something as simple as going to get a water. That's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think while kids might be like apprehensive to structure and and those sorts of things, they they thrive on those types of opportunities. Yeah. Um, so okay so before we close like what like what advice or takeaways do you have for for transfer athletes athletes are trying to be recruited in high school um whatever advice that you have like for those that maybe yeah um one sec i just lost you i'm sorry no you're good you're good Uh, yeah um to kind of like go back to recruiting, like I love recruiting, um, like ask the hard questions. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions, right? And and so I try to always lay everything out there. I would rather lay everything out there and a kid and a family can make a decision where they can say yes or no and they have all of everything they need. Mm-hmm. The worst thing that can happen for any college coach or any kid is they show up to a program and it isn't what they thought it was. Right. 
the worst. It's surprise. It's, yeah, it's emotionally draining, um, yeah. anxiety ridden. Like it's just it's a mess for everyone. And so, like, what I would tell kids is like, ask the hard questions. Like, I'm so sick of hearing like, Coach, what is the typical day in the in the life of Montreal? Like, I'm so tired of hearing that same question, right? Like, Coach, um, you know, what's another one? Oh, Coach, I'm just weighing my options. Mm-hmm. Like just these, it's this, this yeah. cyclical thing that we just hear. Being we, around the bush. Let me tell you what, nothing fires me up to when a coach says, why do you like me? Or, or a player says, coach, why do you want me? Mm-hmm. Like coach, like what, what, how do you think I fit into your program? Mm-hmm. Or like coach, what's the reality of me actually playing for you as a freshman? Mm-hmm. Like those questions fire me up because it shows me like that they've done their research. Nothing fires me e- up even more as when they say, coach, like, how long do you plan on being here? Mm-hmm. Wait, time out. So before you and I met, I posted that early on in my career in recruiting. And I was like, I think it's a fair question to ask. Mm-hmm. How long do you plan on being here? Because that mm-hmm. tells me whether or not you're invested in me and whether or not the coach is invested in the program. How long is your contract? Like, that those are fair questions to ask. Those are totally fair questions. Both ways. Yeah. And I got so much hate for it on Twitter. They were like, Are you kidding me? That's super unprofessional. And I was like, No, I used to be a college coach. If they asked me that, I'd be like, Yo, I'm about to be here this time. Like, these are the things I love and I don't love about the program. Like, yeah. Kids ask me that all the time. It goes both ways. It goes both yeah. ways. The investment goes both ways. Yeah, yeah kids, will, kids will ask me all the time, our parents, like, coach, how long do you plan on being here? And I tell them, like, I'm not looking to go anywhere. I love it here. Like, I, I love our administration. Like, I truly love where I am. Now, if something crazy comes out of the blue and Karen Weekly calls me, I'm going to Tennessee. <laughs> That's it. But, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not actively looking to leave this place because I'm truly happy here. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of players, and again, even coaches, right, they get caught in this rut of like, what's next? What's better? Like they'll up and leave for a $3,000 pay raise and then they're miserable and they get fired from the next spot. Yep. Or a kid will say, well, that school offered me $1,000 more. Well, you're going and you're going to leave it to break anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? Like ask the hard questions. And I, and I firmly believe in asking players like, or, or players asking coaches, coach, how long are you going to be there? And I'm a big believer in asking players, like, are you coming here with the intention to stay? Mm-hmm. Or is this a stepping stone for you? Mm-hmm. Because if they say coach, it's a stepping stone for me. Well, like we're a four year and I'm not going to like, yeah. Go into that whole circus. Like I, I know who I am. I know our role. Like I'm not saying that I'm valuing us more than anybody else, but like we're a four year institution come here with the intent to stay. Right. Like that's the, that's the goal. Um, but yeah, I want kids to ask hard questions or ask coach. Like, I know the program wasn't great. Like, tell us what you did in year one. Like, mm-hmm. what does your practice plan look like? How did you build a culture? Like, what does that look like? Like, how did you hire your staff? Sure. And you can tell like who's genuine and who's not. Right. Just, with the emails, right? Like you get a million emails a day. They all come from field level and NCSA. They all go straight to my spam. I don't even look at them anymore. Like nope. it's, it's. Thank co- you for saying that. We need, you need to say that louder for all yeah. the parents that pay for that stupid stuff that I, they just don't understand and they're wasting their money. So thank and you. And it all saying. comes, and it all comes from a, a database where it says coach weeks and there's a space like this and it's an automated message. And yep. then they, it. like, I totally get it. Right. Like, um, and, and it's just about having feel, right? Mm-hmm. Like our, we're $48,000 a year. It is not cheap. Mm-hmm. I think the education that we provide is incredible. I think it's worth it. But at the end of the day, don't come here and say, well, coach, I've got 10 bucks mm-hmm. like, and yeah. I'm not taking out loans. Yeah. Well, then obviously you didn't do your homework. Mm-hmm. Like, we're laying that all out there for the kid, but don't go through the process and then say, well, you don't have my major or it's right. Not financially. Like you had an idea up front because we talk about that. Mm-hmm. Right. There's nothing worse than when you get a kid emotionally invested, a family emotionally invested, and then you talk money and they're like, well, obviously this isn't going to work. Yeah. Like the, the, the damage is done. Like lay it all out, out front, your first phone call, second phone call, let them know before they visit. Like don't make them fly across the country to visit 
for them to turn around and say, well, we can't afford to come here anyway. And so for me, like I, I get so fired up when kids ask hard questions because it shows me that they really care. Oh, you know, my kids, or, or when the kids, you know, like Instagram, social media, right. They, they like, in, they follow me on Instagram, like you just did. Or they say, well, coach, like I saw your wife, Sydney, did she play softball? And I'm like, yeah, she did. Like, mm -hmm. Or she said, or, or a kid like two weeks ago, a kid said, you know, I know you have a, a little boy and a little girl. And I was like, yeah, I do. Like that stuff, like it just makes me feel good as a coach where now I'm turning around saying, okay, I want this kid. I don't care if she's good or not. Like, mm -hmm. and I'm going to give her more money because at least she did her homework. Mm -hmm. I wish know? I'd tell my kids to ask a question with some research behind it. So like, yeah. hey, I... And I noticed you had X amount of players on your team that academics are a priority for me. They were academic All-Americans. You mm -hmm. had five academic All-Americans. What were their majors? Like, yeah. like how hard, like, I want to be a sports management major. Okay, I was sports management, but like, I want to be a sports <laughs> manager, right? Like, like, what do the classes look like for your athletes? Like, or yeah. hey, I want to be a nursing major. Like, I noticed like that, you know, there's obviously some like push and pull there. Like it's down specifically to the program. Like, what would that look like? Like, I know I have to complete X, Y, and Z course. And then clinicals are going to be this, like they've gone into the specific program to look at like, and, and I always try to tell them that like, when you're asking questions, like when you're on the phone, like, Hey, Oh, I noticed like, for example, like a kid asked me um, that had, you know, questions about Reinhardt university. I was like, Hey, I, it's in a small town, but it's adjacent to a bigger town. Hey, so do most of your kids go shop, you know, like shopping there? Like what's, you know, you're like, you've done your research, not like, oh, coach. So like, what do you look for in an athlete? Blah, blah, blah. I, I look for, I say, okay, hey, you, I know you have three All-Americans. Like, like what, I want to be an All-American. So what are they doing that I'm not doing? Mm -hmm. Right. Totally. Specific questions. Um, I try to tell my athletes that, and like, and I'm not gonna, you know, obviously both of you guys know what I do, like on the other side, but like the specificity and the individual, um, or personalization that like I do on, as I would say, I can only speak to myself, like as an advisor is like, uh, you know, a ways difference of just teaching kids and, and mentoring kids. And, and like I said, I, um, you know, like, yeah, we have a platform that, you know, sends out emails um, that aren't specific to college coaches. But the cool thing is, is the next round of emails are like, oh, I like that school. Uh, hey, Coach Weeks. Uh, wow. Like you won 30 games last year in your first year. Like, tell me more about your coaching philosophy, blah, blah, blah. blah right. And yeah. and and we have a values list like values matter, like mm -hmm. values matter. Like if you tell me that that cost is the top of your priority list after we've gone through this process six months, that's a problem. Yeah. That's a huge problem because we don't yeah. know the schools we're targeting. Right. Yep. So yeah. No, yeah. And a big thing for me, Ashley, like I'll tell you is I think a lot of coaches too, um, they're looking for answers and then they move on to the next kid. Yeah. Like that is not me. I have a picture from Arizona. Her name is Mackenzie Flores. Our first phone call was before Christmas. She committed in May. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It, like five and a half months. Low burn. Right. And so like, and again, I have a whole process that I can share with you guys. Like, but every time I call or text, it's not always business. Sure. It's, Hey, I saw you through a great game last night. Great job. Mm -hmm. Hey, like, I can't wait to follow your game on game changer because yep. you're playing, you know, X, Y, Z on Saturday, mm -hmm. like, or she, maybe she had a bad game and Hey, like continue to lead your team bounce back. Like, that's a huge thing for me, right? And so as kids are navigating this process, especially very good JUCO players where they're getting hit up all the time, like those constant reminders that I'm not just trying to sell you something mm -hmm. goes a long way. Yep. Right? It goes a long way. Um, depth. Gives it depth. Correct. Like, yeah. it, again, Mackenzie Flores committed and she never even visited. She literally just showed up last week with her family, ready to go. All of my West Coasters out of, I would, let's just say 15 on the team, maybe two of them visited prior to committing, maybe mm -hmm. two. Like that tribute to what you, the, the type of recruiting mechanisms and person sure. you have. 
Right. Yeah. It, and it's a personal touch, right? Like I don't necessarily want to be their dad, but like, I want them to understand, like, we're laying it out there for you. We're telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, here's a virtual campus tour. Like, this is everything that we have to offer. Like, right. we're not trying to, to pull the shade over your eyes. Like, this is like, this is who we are. Right. This is what we're about. Here's what we believe in. Does it fit what you're looking for or not? Sure. Like, that's it. And so I can't tell you how many times, like, I've landed a kid in, in start to finish was three to five months, but just because like we kept on, we kept on, it wasn't always money. It wasn't always softball. It was, Hey, I know. I remember you told me your grandma was sick. Like how's she mm -hmm. doing? You no, know, or like empathy, 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 empathy. Correct. That stuff goes a long way. Caring about the things that they care about right. goes a long way. And again, I'm not perfect. I still have so much to figure out. Like, but Again, the one thing I have figured out is like how to treat them well, how to care for them and and just give them the best experience that we can, you know? So Well, Corbin, you can surely use this uh episode as a recruiting tool. <laughs> yeah. Um, no if you want us to edit this and kind of just make little snippets, uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I have no problem waving the Montreat flag for you. So I'll be honest with you guys, like the kids that I have the hardest trouble with are the Midwest kids. You know, the, the Wisconsin. Nice. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many kids I've reached out to from Wisconsin, and then they commit to one of those D three schools in state. There's well, it's in state. Yeah, they get in state tuition. And again, like money, financials, it makes sense. Like yeah. apples. There's a lot of UW schools here. Well, a lot of competitors. Don't worry. Yeah. Andy has all the connections in Wisconsin. I have some in Illinois. I do yeah. whatever you need, yeah. Corbin. I'll be there for yeah. you, buddy. That's I'm I've I bet you I reached out to at least five, probably five or more Wisconsin kids and not like not even a phone call. Well if wow. I don't know their name, they must suck. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, but again, I also want a diverse roster. Like that's a big deal for me. Bring yeah. different spots and um, well, in my space, I'm I mean, as I texted you earlier today or yesterday, today, where I was like, yo, this kid's looking at you. Um, yeah. but they're concerned about that you can only recruit like your North Carolina kids. I'm like, no. I was a South Dakota kid, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, like he he recruits all over the place. Most of his kids are and oh yeah, that's super awesome. So yeah, um, yeah, you 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 have a fan here. And like I said, like, you know, cool thing is is Andy's st Andy's still in the in the game and I'm still in the game. So whatever yeah. whatever you need, you just be like, yo, I need this kid, and I'm like, we'll find <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I appreciate you know. It. So, um, I just, I, I, to be honest, I just want to be the person that I never had to help high school kids and respect, respect. You know, I never had an advisor. I like it was pre Twitter. <laughs> so like, yep. you know, and it was like, I don't even think we had, I mean, we had like dial up internet where you plug the computer. Yeah. Into oh it. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but it was kind of like blind chance. Like when I played baseball and played travel ball, hoping to be seen by somebody and, sure. um, you know, our baseball coach here, Jason Beck, he recruited me to play ball and then he recruited me to come here on his staff. And like, I've learned a lot from him, good and bad. Like, um, but like the one thing that he's taught me is like, just be where your feet are. Like, Love that. yeah, just be where your feet are. Coach, and, and, I say that to my kids all the time. Uh, you know, we just, we just got a new locker room um, right by the field and we're putting lockers in it. And then I made a comment the other day and I was like, you know, I wish it was a little bit bigger, this and that. And like, he almost backhanded me. I was like, dude, yeah. just be happy with what you have. Yeah. Like, and I really think that that's something that we as coaches need to continue to pour into our players because we live in this society of like, what's next? What's, what's next? Yeah. Like we can always do better. And and I believe in doing better for yourself, but I, I also believe in like being where your feet are. You know what I mean? And, and again, like, it's really sad that the college coaching world, like there's coaches taking jobs now and teams are already on campus. Yes, I know like, that's great for them personally, but it's like, at what point do you lay your roots and say, I'm going to make this place the best place I can be. Right. Right. If, when God moves me, he moves me. Mm -hmm. But until then, like my roots are here. I'm going to be the best coach I can be. I'm going to be the best dad I can be the best husband I can be. And when the time comes to move, the time comes. But like, I just wish athletes and coaches and, and even myself, like just 
focus more on just being where we are and making it the best. I love that. Respect, coach. I love it. We'll be your Thanks. we'll be your recruiters. I'll be yeah. your Midwest recruiter. I appreciate that. I need some help out there. No, I'm serious. I will. I I got I got people. No. I got numbers. Yeah. We're on the road. We've worked. My staff has worked um 22 recruiting events from January 1st to now. And then we have another 16 from next weekend to Christmas. Well, hopefully so, we don't do that as often anymore. <laughs> yeah. So we um I know I'm going to Don Battles out in California. Um, I love to go to Yuma. Um, there's an organization called E1 out there, and they run a yep. big thing called Calzona down in Yuma, which is really cool. And um, I had a blast, and so now I'm taking my whole staff. So we're going to go to San Diego for a week or Fun. five days um, and then go to Arizona. Um, I'll be there. Yeah. We do a lot of recruiting in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, and so it's – it's good. We we have a diverse team. And then obviously like I hit the NWAC tournament. I've got six or seven NWAC kids and and so I like the Northwest kids. I really do. So for sure. Well, it's been fantastic having you on. There's so many good nuggets that you've you've shared with us and I think people can can take from but also I feel like people are like okay I'm gonna hit up Corbin I'm gonna go to Montreal yeah well I'll tell you like there's a couple people like NAI coaches you need to get on this I mean yeah. um you know Dana at Johnson okay. um played at Oklahoma won a national championship her pitching coach came from Tennessee her huh. other sister played at Lipscomb Dana is is amazing um um who else uh, the coach from Georgia Gwinnett, I'm actually about to start a mentorship group with her, um, which I'm super, like, super excited about. Um, there's some great, great coaches. I know Kayla down at Southeastern in Florida. She came from Southern Miss. Um, and there's a lot of coaches that have come from big-time softball that are pouring, pouring into the NAI. Um, and so, like, there's some, there's some tremendous people. But, again, like, until we all start bringing awareness to NAI softball, like, kids are just going to be in the dark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take your recommendation and hit up all these people. So for sure. Appreciate it. Yeah. My well, pleasure. Thanks, coach. Yeah. It's been fantastic having you on. Uh,